What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Kelly Patterson was given on June 4th, 2013. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to today's devotional. This morning, we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Kelly Patterson, an associate dean in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. We welcome his wife, Janine, who is seated on, seated on the stand, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us. He received his PhD from Columbia University, where he studied public opinion and voting behavior. Professor Patterson has directed the KBYU Utah College's exit poll that has surveyed votes in the state of Utah for over 30 years. He has worked on national and statewide surveys on topics relating to politics, policy, and voter choice. Additionally, his publications appear in a variety of academic journals. Brother Patterson has served previously as chair of his Department of Political Science and currently is an associate dean in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. He and his wife, Janine, are the parents of two children. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Kelly Patterson. I would like to thank BYU for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I have had the amazing privilege of teaching at this wonderful university for almost 20 years. I love BYU and what it has meant for my family, my students, and me. Indeed, I would like to thank my family, many of whom are seated here, my colleagues, many of whom came today, and my students, uh, once again, who didn't have to come here but did. But especially, I would like to thank my family. I love you all very much. You have made this experience for me one of joy and happiness. Today, I would like to talk about wandering and wondering. The topic of this devotional has been percolating in my mind for a while. Bishop Stephen Knott, who is bishop in the 10th Ward in the Salt Lake Married Student Second Stake, and yes, that stake is associated with the University of Utah, asked me to speak to his ward about faith. He was concerned about the challenges being posed to the faith of some of the members. He did not want me to speak about the concept of faith per se, but about those elements of our modern culture that challenge faith. Today, I hope to expand a little upon the ideas I discussed with those remarkable students that day. Let me start out with a little bit of a disclaimer. What we are going to talk about today is one way to address these issues, not the only way. Many of you will never struggle with issues of faith, but some of you might. There are a variety of ways to approach these issues. And I'm really only talking about the way in which I have attempted to play with them. Now, I use the word play intentionally. Play implies spontaneity or seeing something afresh. Reflecting about and deepening faith is quite enjoyable and rewarding. It can also, much like play, refresh and revive you so that you can continue your many other responsibilities with more insight and vigor. But learning about and living with faith is a personal journey. I expect that many of you will and should approach these issues somewhat differently than I have. What I hope you understand is that they can be addressed, that you can take what is beautiful and true about the gospel of Jesus Christ and live in a world that is not always friendly to faith. Tensions do exist between your faith and some of the norms of the world but it certainly seems possible to find a balance between the two demands. To put it bluntly, you can know that Jesus is the Christ and that he restored his gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith at the same time that you can immerse yourself in the wonders of the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences, and other disciplines of knowledge. The dichotomy between faith and reason, so popular today, is in some respects a product of the 17th and 18th centuries, as the thinkers of the Enlightenment sought to attack organized religion as a means of loosening its grip on society. 
Enlightened thinkers, Enlightenment thinkers, such as the most ardent proponents of the French Revolution, launched an all-out war on religion because it stood in the way of the thorough remaking of society that they envisioned. In the process, a caricature of religion emerged that to some extent has persisted to this day. What I hope you will understand is that seeing reason and faith as incompatible necessarily distorts both reason and faith. Indeed, the faster that you reject this false dichotomy, the quicker you can get started with the business of developing the full range of talents and abilities that will make you so valuable in the Lord's kingdom. So often, all we see are the two mutually exclusive alternatives. However, there are often other ways to approach a question or problem. Let me illustrate this with a story. I like to run, and there is a small group of runners here at BYU with a branch in Salt Lake City that we call the Eight Minute Gang. I won't go into the details of why we call it the Eight Minute Gang, but it has nothing to do with our pace. We have run all over this state together and have participated in several races. The first marathon by one of the members of the Eight Minute Gang was the Deseret News Marathon. Now, the D News Marathon is run on July 24th in Salt Lake City and follows the route of the pioneers down Immigration Canyon. What a way to celebrate, huh? It is a brutal run. So brutal, in fact, that one member of the Eight Minute Gang simply joins us at the mouth of Immigration Canyon to carry our water on the sun-drenched foothill section of the course. He doesn't even want to run the whole thing. He just wants to carry our water. The heat saps all of your energy, and the relentless pounding of the steep downhill course turns your quadriceps into ground beef. True. <laughs> On this particular day, our brave runner from the Eight Minute Gang made it as far as the corner of 13th East and South Temple, only three miles from the finish line in Liberty Park, at which time he pulled off the course and collapsed onto a shaded lawn, mercifully shaded, I might add. Another member of the gang and I encouraged him to get up and to get up soon before his legs seized up. Eventually, we helped him up, and he uttered the words that now live in Eight Minute Gang lore. I can't walk, and I can't run, but I can shuffle. <laughs> and shuffle he did until the finish line. <laughs> Shuffling was, in essence, an option we hadn't considered until faced with the necessity of either, of either dropping out or starting to run again. Similarly, modern society most often provides us with the mutually exclusive options of being either faithful or rational. However, we have many more interesting and intriguing possibilities before us. The Lord has furnished us with two models to help us cope with the tension we often face between faith and reason. These two models take the form of the wanderer and the wanderer. Both of these types appear prominently in our scripture and provide us postures we ought to consider assuming as we confront the challenges of living in a modern world. I want you to notice that as we combine the models of the wander and the wonder, we can actually carve out another way to live in a world that often forces a contrived set of choices upon us. The first model is that of the wanderer. The wanderer is an individual or people who are not completely and wholly comfortable in this world. They know that this world is only a passage to another world. Consequently, these individuals never become too at home here in the world because, because they know their real home is somewhere else. Examples of wanders abound in the scriptures. Abraham, Moses, the children of Israel, the Nephites, the Jaredites, and even our own pioneer history all emphasize wandering. In perhaps one of the most poignant passages, poignant and poetic passages in the Book of Mormon, Jacob, the brother of Nephi, states in Jacob chapter 7, verse 26, I conclude this record, declaring that I have written according to the best of my knowledge, by saying that the time passed away with us, and also our lives passed away, like as it were unto us a dream. We being a, we being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers, emphasis there on wanderers, 
cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation, in a wilderness, and hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions. Wherefore, we did mourn out our days. Now, this is not an aimless wandering. This is a description of a wandering as a separation from what is familiar or comfortable. It is a wandering that is designed to take the individuals or people out of the situation in which they find themselves so that the Lord could teach them the gospel and make sacred covenants with them. The wandering wrenches them out of the comforts, habits, and routines that can dull their senses and fixate their desires on the mundane. The wandering removes the residue of the world from off of them and creates openings for Heavenly Father to teach them his gospel. We are often likened to wanders and even admonished to act as such. It is perhaps in this vein that we could read the discourse on faith that Paul sends to the Hebrews. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, he recounts all these tremendous acts accomplished through faith. It's really a beautiful chapter of scripture. And the trials suffered by those who believed. He then says in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These were individuals different from the world and who resided in places that made the attractions of the world less immediate to them. We are not asked expressly to wander in deserts and in mountains, but we are asked not to become too comfortable here. This is not our home. It is with this type of awareness in mind that the political theorist Michael Walzer writes about the Israelites, and so the wilderness had to be a new school of the soul. Wandering on this earth for our appointed time is our school of the soul. However, we can only learn from this school if we take the initiative to enroll and ref to reflect on the meaning and splendor of its lessons. The model of the wanderer is not sufficient by itself. For this reason, the second model is that of the wanderer. Here also we have numerous examples after which to pattern our lives, such as Adam, Lehi, Nephi, the apostles John and Paul, and the prophet Joseph Smith. But perhaps the example I love the most comes from the consummate wanderer and wanderer, Moses. Moses establishes his credentials early as a wanderer. In the Pearl of Great Price, we have the account of Moses' grand vision. There are two critical parts in this vision that apply to the idea of wonder. In chapter 1, verse 10, Moses' reflections produce this perceptive phrase. Now for this cause, I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. To have a deep sense of wonder, we must recognize the limits to our own understanding. So often we are quick to think that we already understand how the world works. Moses' realization that man is nothing now makes it possible for him to make real progress. He is not starting with the assurance of what he thinks he already knows. Think of the freshman we've taught. <laughs> but with the understanding that there is much more to learn from a source that seems to have so much more wisdom and knowledge than he had previously thought possible or understood. What does Moses now do with this enriched understanding? The answer appears in verse 30 of chapter 1, where he now seizes the full import of his new understanding and asks the questions that go to the very heart of wonder. This verse states, And it came to pass that Moses called upon God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, why these things are so, and by what thou madest them. Once again, these two questions are at the center of wonder. When we stare up at the night sky and see the brilliance of the stars, or when we hold a baby in our arms for the very first time, or when we contemplate on the death of a loved one, we cannot help but wonder why these things are so and by what they were made. These two questions form the core of all human wondering and questioning up to our present day. 
So what does wandering and wondering do for you? What sorts of perspectives should a productive merging of these two postures impart to you? And this is where we get to the kind of recommendations of the talk. First, you should acknowledge that the gospel of Jesus Christ does not, and this I must emphatically say, does not require you to check your intelligence at the door. Think of what the prophet Joseph Smith wrote during his imprisonment in Liberty Jail. And I quote, the things of God are of deep import and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens and search into and contemplate the lowest considerations of the darkest abyss and expand upon the broad considerations of eternal expanse he must commune with God. How much more dignified and noble are the thoughts of God than the vain imaginations of the human heart? None but fools will trifle with the souls of men. You cannot contemplate the things of God without some distance between you and the world and without a stance of wonder and awe. Furthermore, we do not shy away from the hard work of thinking and contemplating. It is not our heritage. Parley P. Pratt, B.H. Roberts, and literally hundreds of others have pushed us as a people in our short history to think and to think profoundly. My grandfather Patterson was a missionary in the Eastern States Mission in 1927 when Elder B.H. Roberts was president of that mission have a copy of his journal here with me today. Elder Roberts had an extensive six-week school which he uh, with which he prepared his missionaries for the rigors of missionary life. Elder Roberts cared deeply about his missionaries and wanted them to develop the spiritual, intellectual, and physical gifts that would help them succeed. He pushed them very hard to think about the gospel and to develop the ability to preach it and defend it. In this journal that I did bring with me today, my grandfather accords his journal what I think is the essence of the work required of us to learn the gospel. Now, before I get started, imagine this. My, my grandfather is fresh off the farm in Clinton, Utah. Okay? So he's not one of these really sophisticated type individuals. He, this was probably, this was his first trip really outside of Utah. So on January 27, on 17th, 1927, he wrote, School started out as per schedule, and we have been following the schedule all week. And it certainly put one's nerves on edge, for my head has felt like a boiler factory. But it was worth it just to hear President Re Roberts talk. Okay? So he was really being put through the ringer. Okay? So the next day, January 18th, he records, school went along as scheduled, even if my head did hurt. So we're not stopping for his headache. <laughs> January 20th, school as usual, head still hurting. And January, uh, and, well, January 19th, 20th, and January 20th, school as usual, head still hurting. I mean, this, this theme occurs over and over again. Now, lest you think this ends with my grandfather's head exploding, he records on January 21st. Just had school till noon, had the rest of the day to catch up on our loafing. Okay. We can and should do the hard work of thinking and of engaging with those who have considered similar questions within the academic disciplines. It is part of the charm of wondering. But when it comes to doing the hard thinking, though, Latter-day Saints start from the premise that there is more than just knowledge to be gained. Latter-day Saints, with their stance as wanderers, know that there is a reality beyond the present, which gives the thinking and questioning a genuine purpose. As the Book of Mormon states in 2 Nephi chapter 9, Verses 28 and 29. When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God. For they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. There's a second perspective we gain as we blend the stances of wander and wonder. As you encounter the secular world, you will hear representations made against religion, 
God, communities of believers, and many other aspects of faith. As you encounter such representations, your stance as a wanderer and a wonderer should already have prepared you to scrutinize carefully the assumptions of those who only make the worst representations about faith. As a wanderer, you should not feel completely at home with the fads and trends, trends in thinking that you see in the world. You should, have already, you should already have some misgivings about them. As somebody committed to wonder, you can continuously pursue knowledge about the heavens and gain insights and understanding that many in the world never choose to achieve. For example, how many individuals do you know who get tripped up on the idea of evil or why bad things happen to good people? Many of the current negative representations of religion make assumptions about God, nature, and the heavens that students and followers of the restored gospel do not make. The idea of a pre-existence and the choice that we made to come to earth and learn how to make and keep covenants provides us with a perspective on evil that most people simply ignore. Our gospel-aided insights do not keep us from being sad at the presence of evil, but they do help us to see that it is not completely and utterly senseless and cruel of our Heavenly Father to put us here. Third, Wandering and wondering should also make you careful about the assumptions you entertain about your own faith. The assumptions that lurk in the background of your thinking exercise a powerful influence, and if you are not careful and self-reflective, they may sometimes guide you to the wrong place. Seeing yourself as a wanderer humbles you and helps you avoid turning your own ideas into idols. Wandering brings with it meekness. And wonder supplies the enthusiasm to call upon your Heavenly Father as you seek to understand Him and His plan. For example, when you hear the word prophet, what are the descriptions that leap into your mind and shape your judgments? How many of you think that the Lord was constantly holding on to the prophet Joseph Smith's elbow and whispering into his ear during his waking and even his sleeping hours? If your standard assumptions or understanding of a prophet, or any church leader for that matter, are more rigorous than what the Lord expects, then you set yourself up for disappointment and maybe even anger. As Elder Holland said in the April 2013 conference, so be kind regarding human frailty, your own as well as that of those who serve with you in a church led by volunteer mortal men and women. Except in the case of his only perfect begotten son, imperfect people are all God has ever had to work with. That must be terribly frustrating to him, but he deals with it. So should we. And when you see imperfection, remember that the limitation is not in the divinity of the work. There is much that we can gain from adopting the stance of a wanderer and a wonderer. As wanderers, we gain a critical perspective on the categories of thinking that pervade a world that seems increasingly hostile to faith. As wonders, we embrace the beauty and mysteries of our journey here. As wonders, we fulfill the design of the 13th article of faith. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. We seek after the knowledge gifts, and wisdom, because according to Brigham Young, we are trying to be the image of those who live in heaven. We are trying to pattern after them, to look like them, to walk and talk like them. These are indeed lofty aspirations. And they are the aspirations of the wanderer and the wonderer. The person who is not at home here, but who wonders often about this home and the destination to which he can be fitted. As the late Neil, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, the restored gospel is buoyant, wide, and deep beyond our comprehension. It edifies whether concerning divine design in the universe or stressing the importance of personal chastity and fidelity. Only meek disciples can safely handle such a bold theology. Brothers and sisters, we can repurpose the tension between the world and such a bold theology by taking the best of what the wanderer and the wonder have to offer us. 
we can creatively use the examples of wandering and wandering to blaze a reliable and exhilarating path back into the presence of our Heavenly Father. I leave you today with my testimony of the beauty and truth of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Kelly Patterson was given on June 4th, 2013. 